150 years ago, Franciscan friars searching for a mission site planted the first grapes in the Napa Valley north of San Francisco. Today, almost 23,000 acres of grapes are under cultivation, and the Napa wine industry is a billion-dollar business. The valley has flourished under a unique set of circumstances, a climate like the French Bordeaux region, with warm sunny days and cool nights, and a population of growers and vintners who, through plague and prohibition, have nurtured the tradition of fine winemaking. And be it a boom or a groundswell, in the past 10 years, the American public has begun to appreciate the industry and its art. I've seen this happen. I've had all the confidence in the world that this would progress each year. And each year it has progressed that uh, way. In fact, ever since I've been in the wine business, in the table wine business, since 1937, never once have our sales dropped. They have increased in table wines constantly. And I see this going on for the next 10 or 15 years without any hesitation. On the contrary, it looks better now than ever because of increased quality, increased knowledge, increased total involvement. You know, to do anything outstanding, it takes total involvement. There is an enormous capital commitment to the wine business. The vines that are planted this year will not bear for three to five years. The red wine grapes that are picked this year will not be ready to drink until about 1982. Andy Beckstoffer, president of the Napa Growers Association, says that would-be wine growers come to the valley thinking they are investors, only to discover that, like it or not, they are farmers. So the winemaker is at, at the, the mercy of the fruit he gets. If, if we produce a bad fruit here, the winemaker can, can do but so much with it. He can do something, but you know, the, the wine is made in the vineyard. It's very clear, and so we're both at the mercy of nature. So the winemakers deal in futures. They expect U.S. wine consumption to double within the next 10 years, and yet the average American adult now drinks about a gallon a year, the average Californian less than three gallons, while the typical Frenchman guzzles a hearty 20 gallons. Although vintners and growers modestly insist that there is no more than respectable profit in their industry, there are now 73 wineries in the valley and an average of one a month starting up. Not surprisingly, competition is keen. Surprisingly, though, Competition seems to have brought out the best the Valley has to offer. While the American way often seems to mean bigger and cheaper and faster, quantity at the expense of quality, for some reason that hasn't happened here. While growers and vintners have taken all technology has to offer, adapted techniques of pruning and picking, crushing, fermenting and bottling, big wine producers like Robert Mondavi still measure themselves by traditional standards. I think it's the feeling of knowing that we can produce wines, in our case, I mean, as Robert Mondavi Wine, we can produce wines equal to the smallest producer because everything that we've done has been based upon duplicating what the dedicated small vintner will do. So we bought our equipment, our facilities, and we taught, uh, taught our people to have the same love and desire in wine as we ourselves. It takes people to make a business. And once you do that, you'll find that they'll guard that just as well as they own the business themselves. But that takes about four or five years to communicate that. And as long as you do it, they will do it too. And if you believe in it, they will believe in it too. Business is good. And the wine that flows from this fertile valley is staking out a reputation among the finest vintages in the world. But it is not the grapes alone that make the Napa Valley special. It is the people who nurture the ancient art and fulfill a private ambition. And tomorrow, our California excursion to the Napa Valley will continue with a closer look at the people who make the wine. Carol Kendrick, News 8, the Napa Valley. Anyone who has ever dreamed of pulling up stakes and settling in a little Napa Valley winery has probably imagined a life much like Jack Davies. He left a career in industrial management, bought a big Victorian house and a run-down winery, and set about to produce champagne in the classic French manner. Davies was a businessman who liked wine. He had no plans to make it a career, but he dreamed of starting his own business, and there seemed to be room in the valley for a man who could give the attention to detail required in the production of fine champagne. Well, for us, I think it gradually crept up on us as we assembled uh, a way of doing things. And uh, when, as I told you, when we were looking for a kind of small enterprise to move into, 
uh, it seemed like a very uh, logical possibility because of our own personal feelings and because of the obvious trend in American life toward accepting wine as a, you know, a facet of eating and living. His commitment was quickly rewarded. Only seven years after he reopened the old Schramsburg winery, his champagne was chosen to be served at the state dinner during President Nixon's trip to China. Davies has meticulously restored the Schramsburg facility. The winery dates back to 1862. Here the wine is prepared for the start of the process that turns it sparkling. Here he notes the first basic rule of champagne making. It takes good wine to make good champagne. It also takes time and the Schramsburg champagne cellars, tunneled into the side of the hill, keep the new wine still and cool as yeast and sugars ferment the liquid into cork-popping effervescence. After about two years aging in the bottles, the wine is ready for market. First, the riddling, where the yeast solids are gathered to the neck of the bottle. Then the degorgement, where the solids are frozen and popped out, and the wine sweetened with brandy sugars for more palatable drinking. There are easier ways to make champagne, these days, some champagnes are chemically carbonated, like soda pop. But despite his business savvy, Jack Davies would not take those shortcuts. I personally find myself that uh, I have always uh, enjoyed from a glass of wine more, uh, as I've said, than what I actually pour out of the bottle. Uh, I mean that in the sense that wine uh, is not a commodity kind of product. It, is a very, it can be a very individual product. And uh, one man's Cabernet is very unlike the next man's, and they can both be very well made, but they just simply don't come across to you the same. Uh, and therefore, there's something to talk about. There's something to think about. There's something to inquire into. Uh, there's something to learn about. The Napa Valley has attracted settlers from all over the world, people whose pride and ambition are wrapped up in the wines. And maybe because of the fact, in fact, I suspect very much because of the fact, then in our world today, there is so much that is stereotyped and sterile and spoon-fed and uh, pre-processed and standardized and scooped out and square boxed to us, that, of over which we have very little influence, that we are all anxious to find things that are absolutely the contrary of that. And wine comes along saying, gosh, here's a thing that uh, swims against the stream. And I know some person made this wine, and it came out of some ground somewhere, and it, it was really grapes one day. And, and I think it is an antidote, maybe, for standardization of life. The wine may bring a special kind of immigrant, but it is not only the wine that makes the Napa Valley special. It is men like Jack Davies, for whom life itself has a heady bouquet. Carol Kendrick, News 8, the Napa Valley.